Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. Well, George, how's Floyd's in London? And how are you holding up in this hot weather? Johnny, all I can say is I wish I could make a trip to France at somebody else's expense. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I just received a transatlantic telephone call, collect, by the way, from that underworld friend of yours in Paris. De Marsac. Louis de Marsac. Yes. Calls himself Le Chagri. That's right, the gray cat. Well, why he ever chose to call himself that? I... Because at night all cats are gray. So he's hard to see in the dark. Well, so... free enough yourself, Paris after dark. And de Marsac knows more about the dark alleys and sewers and back streets. But what did he call you about, George? He wants to talk to you about the only diamond. The what? Three quarters of a million dollars worth of diamonds, a necklace, that was stolen from the Earl of Olney during a recent visit to the United States. The Chagri has a lead on him? He wouldn't say, but if he has, you can get them back. Well, believe me, we shan't quibble over your expense account. Including whatever may be necessary to grease the palm of de Massac? His information usually comes pretty high, you know. I understand that. And uh, a bit of an allowance, shall we say, for my own entertainment while I'm there? Well, now, don't go overboard, Johnny. Sure, I'll be in touch. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. The Floyds of London, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the night in Paris matter. Expense account item one, $12 even for a call to Paris, France. To a man I wouldn't trust any further than you could throw the loo. Louis de Massac. Oh, oui, oui, monsieur Dollar. This is your oldest, your dearest friend, the Chagri. Oldest and dearest friend, huh? But of course. One of the crookedest, chiselingest connivers I ever met. Oh, but no. George Reed says you have some information about the only diamond, which means you've got your hand out, as usual. Oh, believe me, one of me. I only told him that I wish to speak to you about something. You didn't hint around about those diamonds? Mm-hmm. Well, perhaps I did make some very slight reference about them. Yeah. When he objected to my phoning him, what you call collect. You know where those diamonds are, to my sack? Well? <sighs> okay, how much do you want this time? Monsieur, you, you are speaking of money? What else? <laughs> you hurt me. Touch me to the quick. Oh, sure. How much? Well, one might think that I slave and suffer and risk my life on your behalf only for money. How much, to my sex? <laughs> Say, $10,000 American. Yeah, well, it was nice to talk to you. See you around sometime. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. The only diamonds are worth millions. Millions of francs, not dollars. Yes, but if I could tell you where you may find them... In that case, I might be willing to part with, say, uh, a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred. Five thousand. If I actually get my hands on them, I'll give you two. Four. Three thousand. That's final. Thirty-five hundred. Goodbye, to my sack. No, uh, twenty-five hundred. I said I. Huh? Two thousand. Two. Okay, two thousand bucks. Yeah. Then, oh, then I think I would. What you say? Crossed myself up. Yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> but do not worry, money me. Do not worry. I will do the same for you. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Really? Now listen, if I take a plane out of New York a little after nine tonight, I should get there tomorrow at five forty-five p.m. Paris time. Maybe. I'll hang my hat at the Hotel of Bois. You know where that is? But of course. Then I'll pick you up at that hovel of yours at the end of the uh, the uh... Rue de Pont de la Moule. Yeah, the Rue de Pont de la Moule. <laughs> and you will bring the money for me. I'll be there. Expense account item two, a thousand dollars worth of American Express Travelers checks. Four hundred and twenty-eight of them went for plane fare, Hartford to New York to Paris. The flight was uneventful, except for the person who occupied the seat next to me. Annette was her name, Annette Dubon. And brother, well, she's twenty-five or six, I guess. Tall, brunette, and beautiful. Apparently, has money of her own. I decided this trip to Paris wasn't a bad idea at all. Johnny Dollar? Yeah. Oh, I know who you are. 
you're the insurance investigator I hear about all the time on the radio. Well, don't look so shocked about it. Shocked? I'm thrilled. Tell me all about you. Oh, I'd a lot rather talk about you. Plan to be a personal? Oh, a couple of weeks, I guess. Just sort of a vacation. And I'm all alone, so I don't have any definite plans. Ah. Have you, Johnny? I have now. <laughs> You certainly don't beat around the bush, do you? You know something? I like that. Oh, good, good. Now, where do you be staying? The Joy Sang. All right, then as soon as I get things cleared away, I'll call you. Are you over here to work on some kind of a case? Um, no, just to see an old friend of mine. Are you by any chance staying at the Joy Sang? The Lavoie. It's over on... I know where it is. And as soon as you're free, you'll call me, too. Are you kidding me? Well, about that time, the stewardess, bless her heart, came around with a champagne. So, what with one thing and another, the time passed quickly. Then, at exactly 5.45 p.m. Paris time, we landed at Orly. Item 3, 5.20, American, for a taxi to my hotel, after dropping a net off along the way. I shaved and showered, then took another cab to the dingy little apartment of Louis de Massac at the far end of the Rue de Pas de la Moule. You ask me, it's one of the most disreputable-looking apartments in the whole city. Dirty, squalid, ramshackle. And, of course, Lashad Gris had to live at the top of four long flights of stairs. When I finally got up there, feeling slightly wounded, I noticed that his door at the end of the gas-lit hallway was standing wide open. What? De Marsac. Louis. Louis de Marsac. The dark apartment of Louis de Massac looked like a tornado had struck it. It was a shambles, as though somebody had come in and simply done as much damage as possible, and yet at the same time was looking for something, or someone. As for de Massac, there was no sign of him anywhere. I stood there for a moment, wondering, wondering what to do next. Huh? Hello, hello. Yeah? Monsieur Dollar? Who are you? Now listen. Oh, do you mind telling me what under the sun happened to this joint of yours? Listen, please. You have turned on the light? No, but there's enough light coming up in the street. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you must get out of there. Oh? Yes, come quickly and meet me here. Now, please, you will do that? Well, where are you? You, you are alone? Yes, yes, I'm alone. Then you must leave before somebody finds you there. Like who? There is no time to talk when you meet. Come, please, and meet me here. But where? I'm at the cafe, Chez Macau. Chez Macau. Yes, it's in saint germain de Puy. Uh, what you call beatnik. Okay, I'll find it. Do not delay now. You may be in danger. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I'll grab a taxi. Huh? Who are you? Uh, Au revoir, Hello. Oh, Hello. no, you don't. Monsieur. No. Hello. Hello. Uh, C'est bien. Big. When I came to, I found myself propped up in the remains of a chair. A bottle of cognac and a glass had been placed on a table beside me. I helped myself. And next to it, a piece of paper. I scribbled on it with the words, Je regret. I'm sorry. Don't believe me, if I ever catch up with him, he's going to be a lot sorrier. Another snort of cognac, and I felt able to navigate. I went downstairs, grabbed a taxi, that's item four, a couple of bucks, and had him take me to the place to my second mention over the phone, the Shea Macau. And what a joint. I've seen a few beatnik pads that were pretty crazy back in the States. But nothing to compare with this. It was a smoky, dark, and dirty place. The beatniks packed into it were dirty, too. Characters were made a business of being characters, including a gaunt chick chanting some poetry in a corner. Then a wormy little man sidled up to my table out of the shadows and proceeded to help himself to my drink. Yeah, it was de Massa, the Chagri. Uh, you do not, do not seem to know me at first, one of me. Even when you come over and help yourself to my cognac? In this place, it is the custom. But what, what happened to you when you hang up your telephone on me? Well, somebody sneaked in and worked me over to my sock. Any idea who it might have been? No. I, I hope he did not hurt you too badly. Well, he did all right. But why? Now, why the crazy note he left saying he was sorry? But of course, monsieur. But of course what? Wait, well, he must have thought you were me. Oh? Me? 
because of a little deal on the statue that I made a week ago. In, in my business with some of the terrible people I have to deal with, this sort of thing happens all the time. I'll bet. But then, when, when this man, he discovers he had made a mistake, that you were not me... Uh, oh, sure. What can you, the American, know of the art, the poetry of today? Huh? Now, what brought that on? Yeah, I will translate for you then my lovely, my beautiful ode to nothing. Ode to nothing? Listen to my every magnificent word. Oh, now, wait a minute. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Huh? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, now, look for... The Marseille, come on down to work. Wait, 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 wait. It is all right now. Huh? All right, wait. Really? It was for the benefit of the man who came by the people, who looked at us. Oh, yeah, I noticed him. He was very curious about us, like a spy. A spy? Yes, of course. He may have been from my dear friend, Monsieur Francois Dubesson. Wait a minute. Francois Dubesson. Isn't he the fence who got hold of that painting that was stolen from Vincent Price a while back? Yes, I helped you to recover for a slight fee. And it was through him that you located the Blue Madonna that was taken from the gallery in Philadelphia. They read the scene. And now it is Dubesson who, who has the only diamonds. You're sure of that? I am sure. Also, it was Dubesson who arranged to have them stolen back in your United States. Your good friend, huh? But of course. But you're perfectly willing to double-cross him. Why? Because you will pay me so well. If I get my hands on those diamonds. Oh, well, I have it all arranged. So, if you would like to pay me now, the, the $5,000 American... When I get my hands on him. And it's only 2000 remember? <laughs> Sweetie, I cheated myself. Okay, now, how do I get them? I have told him that you're here, that you are very rich, that you will pay him 15 million francs. 15? Well, that's close to $30,000. It is better that we may lost to you, all right, where will I find him, Miss Francois de Besson? He will come to you. With the diamonds? Yes, at your hotel. Tonight at midnight. He knows my name? Well, I told him that you are Mr. Robert Matthews from Texas. Hey, yeah, good. Then I'll have to take another room under that name. But, of course. And you're sure he doesn't know who I really am? My business? No, 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 because only I could tell him that. All right, now look, Demarsac. If you have any idea, double-crossing me. You? Oh, my oldest, my dearest. <laughs> And yet, if you were to find out about 3,000... Okay, Demarsac. If it all goes off without a hitch. But if it doesn't... <laughs> Have no fear, mon ami. Sure, it was a kind of shady deal to make. To have to make. But under the circumstances, what else? And people simply don't realize how most of the crimes in this world are solved. Not by Sherlock Holmes type of detective work, not by the kind of stuff you read in the mystery magazines, but through informants. And one way or another, they all have to be paid off. Otherwise, well, look at this case. If Dubasson were to know who I really am, I'd stand a chance of not only losing the case, but my life as well. On the way back to my hotel, I began to wonder again about the man who had attacked me there at the Massac's apartment who'd apparently been there before, looking for someone, or for me. Did he really think I was de Marsac? Or was it all just a warning to leave this case alone? There was only one way to find out. Back in my hotel, I arranged for another room under the name of Robert Matthews from Texas, USA. It was a room adjoining my own with a connecting door. In it, using my best Texas drawl, I'd meet Francois Dubasson when he came at midnight with the only diamonds. Fifteen million francs, Demarsac had told him. Little enough for a necklace worth three quarters of a million. But I've never yet paid a thief for the return of stolen goods, and I had no intention of doing so this time. I settled down to wait for midnight. And then I suddenly realized why I'd felt only half-dressed ever since I was attacked over in Demarsac's apartment. Sure, my gun was missing. Without it, and if Dubasson was wise to me was the phone in the other room, the one where I'd act out the part of the rich Texan, if there was any point in it. Hello. Monsieur Matthews? Yep. My name is Dubasson. Francois Dubasson. Say, I've been waiting to hear from you. You are alone, monsieur. Don't think I'd let anybody else in on our little deal, do you? I hope not. I can be there in five minutes. Yeah, any time you say. I'm just laying here in bed reading to myself. You have the necessary money with you, in cash. Just finished taking it out of the hotel safe. Monsieur Matthews, if we 
are able to make what you call uh, a deal. Sure, Sam. Huh? Oui, but I must inform you, I will come to your home prepared for any, uh, shall we say, exigency. Hmm. Now what's that? The gun I carry. It has a silencer. Five minutes. I'll be here. I suddenly had an idea that might, that might possibly work. Out of a small rug, a pair of shoes, and a couple of other things, I fashioned a dummy, laid it carefully in the bed in the other room, after making sure the head of that bed was toward the door. I piled up a couple of pillows so that even if there really had been someone in it, only the outline under the covers would be visible. I left a cigarette burning in an ashtray, propped up a magazine. From the doorway, then, it looked like someone lying there, reading and smoking. I hoped. I unscrewed a light bulb, then stood behind the slightly open adjoining door. Come in, man. Come in. You were very foolish, Monsieur Dollar, to say you obtained the money from the hotel safe. The night clerk has informed me otherwise. Also, he confessed it was you who took both of these rooms. Well, have you anything to say? I told you Dollar was here because of the jewel, Francois. And that? Oui, my chefie. So, Annette, you may dispose of him once and for all. Close the door. No! Look, there's a dummy in that bed. You're right. The dollar has no gun now. And if he's here, Francois... Take care, my chef. Don't worry. First, we try that other room. I nudged open the adjoining door, and with everything I had, I pitched the light bulb across the room at the far wall. No, he's in here! Then I dove in low at the first of them I could reach. <laughs> A bad mistake, Johnny. Because I have the gun. Yeah. I suppose I should have known, Annette. Your last mistake. Because with this silencer, nobody will ever know. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Oh, oh. Oh. oh, dear. Oh, thanks to my sack. Like the U.S. Marine. But such a pity, monsieur. Huh? That I should stoop so low as to strike a beautiful woman. Of course, the fact that it saved my life. Five thousand. Sure. Five thousand. Of course, there'll be some fancy international legal procedure necessary, but I'm sure the company can arrange for return of the necklace to the United States. As for Dubassin and the lovely but treacherous Annette... Well, the Paris police are making the arrangements for them. And I'm sure they won't be very pleasant ones. Expense account total, including a couple of nights on the town, 5000 for De Massac and Deluxe Transportation Back Home, $5,878 even. Wow. Oh, incidentally, I met a luscious little blonde on that return trip who... Well, she... Now, let's not go into that. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a foggy night on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. In the shadows, a killer. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Boris Lewis, G. Stanley Jones, Tony Barrett, Bill James, and Gus Bay. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs>